Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good grace to God, we know that you are a merciful God, but that you will judge us in the end for our lives. Having expected us to live in the reflection of your love and commitment to each and every one of us, we will be held accountable, and rightly so, for our actions here on earth. You've given us a mission to fulfill that Christ began for the salvation of souls. May we reflect that love. May we be worthy of salvation and redemption and the kingdom of heaven now and forever. Amen. In the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So thank you all for coming again tonight. Awesome turnout. Uh, you know, and when I started this a couple of years ago, they told me, don't do it in the summer. No one's going to ever come. You know? And we did the first time, I think, with one of the gospel passages. And last year we did the history of the church. And now here tonight. So it goes to show, if you offer it, people will come. Right? Um, I really appreciate it. And hopefully it's helping you a little bit. Um, because as uh, uncomfortable as some of these topics might be, it's part of the human condition. We have to address it. So, last time we talked about death, right? And now part two, judgment. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> right? So, as we talked about last night, judgment happens immediately. The moment we pass. And how do we define death? The separation of, from the soul from the body. Right? It is not a medical death. Alright? Not the sensation of breathing or the heart, but the separation of the soul from the body. And we do not know when exactly that happens. Okay, so when we hear someone was dead for seven minutes and came back to life, they were never dead. They were never dead. Once the soul departs, that's it. It does not come back. So, and at that very moment, time and space cease. Those are earthly human conditions. And at that very moment, we are judged for our actions. And so judgment. Judgment. And who is the only judge? God. God, right? Now having said that, we're going to talk about our own judgment as well, too. So judgment, what is it? The process of forming an opinion or evaluation by discerning and comparing. An evaluation by discerning and comparing. Okay? So God has an image of what he expects of us. And upon our death, he literally compares it, if you will, and has an answer. We either meet it or we don't. We either meet it or we don't. So we, we bring that judgment upon ourselves. Okay? Because he has already made the evaluation. This is what I expect of every human being. This is how I expect them to live, to reflect my love of, of himself and for each other. And upon that judgment, if it is not met, judgment is held against us in a bad way. If it is met, we are rewarded with the kingdom of heaven for all eternity. So he's already made that evaluation and has discerned it, and upon our judgment, we are compared to what he expects us to be. Now, before we get to eternal judgments, I want to talk about just judgment in our culture today. Right? You hear this all the time. Don't judge me. Right? And if some of you have come to me for confession about that, I tell everyone who brings that up, you better damn well judge people appropriately, appropriately. Only God can judge the state of our soul, our state of our grace, okay? So we can never say, oh, that person's so holy, they're in heaven or they're going to heaven, or they're so evil, they're going to hell. We have no right to say that. Nor can we make superficial judgment based on someone's race, economics, where they live, how they live, sexuality, all those are superficial. We cannot make an assumed judgment upon that. But we can and should make judgment calls 
as I said, by discernment and understanding of people's character and actions. In other words, we as Catholics believe that certain things are right and certain things are wrong. And upon seeing or hearing the wrong thing, we have the right and duty to judge it as wrong. Now, that's only step one though. Step two is to the best of our ability to then point that out to the person and try to help them see their wrong and improve themselves. So we know what is right and wrong. We believe in certain things. And if it's a wrong thing, we have the right and duty to judge it as such. Which one of you has never ever said, oh, you can play with any way you want as a kid? No, you've said, he's a bad influence. You're not allowed to play with him. His actions are wrong. You're not allowed, that's a judgment call. And we have that right and responsibility to judge people, but then to try to help them. And they might tell you some nasty things when, they when you bring that to them. So be it. You're judged on your actions, not on their reactions. So we are absolutely called to judge people appropriately. Not in a damning way, but in a compassionate way that seeks their good. Because we do the same thing to ourselves, right? When we go to confession, we have judged ourselves as having done wrong. And then seek God's mercy and forgiveness. Well, when we see or hear someone that we believe is saying or doing something wrong, we have the right and responsibility to judge that and say it's wrong. It is wrong. The person we cannot judge. What they're doing, saying, we have the right and responsibility to judge as wrong. And then to seek them, if we can, to help them. Unfortunately, this has become the catchphrase, uh, who are you to judge me? I'm not judging you, I'm judging what you're doing. This is wrong and why? So when they say, who are you? Yeah, yeah, I I'm not judging you. God is the only judge of that. I'm judging your actions, and your actions are wrong. And here's why. And why for your own good, you need to change. Not based on what I think, but what Christ tells us through the church. So please, please, when you hear this, don't judge me. Every one of us will be judged. Will be judged on whether how we treat ourselves and do ourselves, and what did we do for the good of others. Because if you just judge them as wrong and go, well, I guess they're going to hell. <laughs> no. You have to, if you can, try to help them directly or indirectly. So don't fall into this culture of don't judge me. Judge people appropriately. Judge their actions appropriately. Don't judge me. It's a crack my kids regularly make to me to each other as a shorthand for give me a break or lighten up. Yet like death, judgment is a serious business and something we are all will all undergo a divine reckoning, a divine reckoning of how well we navigate our earthly existence and made use of the time and grace. Time is going to be a big theme tonight. Time is going to be a big theme because time runs out for all of us. And we don't know when that's going to happen. God granted us here on earth and will take place in two distinct stages with an earth-shattering, momentous event in between. And what that's talking about there is the particular judgment of the individual and then final judgment, the big event in the middle, Christ's second coming. We're going to get into that. So you're going to hear about a lot of earthly time and then eternal life. And when that earthly time ends, it ends. Now, yesterday, so the next part, yesterday we talked about how 
a little bit how Christ is portrayed today in the church. Okay? And I think it's fair to say that in the last 50 to 60 years, there's been a major shift um, prior to when I was born. Christ and God was the hard judge, right? Uh, really strong, watching us, and, 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 and was going to be the final judge, and was almighty and powerful, and in some cases mean, right? And then since then, we've had a shift in how Jesus is portrayed to us, and in my personal opinion, we've gone from one extreme to the other. And what we need is a happy balance between the two. Because if we go from a, being afraid of God, that's not healthy, to, well, we can't sin when no one's going to hell and everything's going to be forgiven, that's not good for us either. So, does anyone know what this is? Where is where's this at? Washington, D.C., right? So this is the uh, Basilica of the Immaculate Conception in Washington, D.C. Um, and Christ is uh, in the uh, rear dome, the mosaic. The mosaic is probably 40, 50 feet tall itself. And he's known as, unofficially, Buff Jesus or Angry Jesus. But if you look at that's why I chose that picture. He's lording over the people, right, in the very church, right? He is the mighty judge. And, you know, when you get the close up, he don't look too happy. He just doesn't look too happy there, right? But this is the way, and you can go to pretty much any major church prior to the 1950s, and most of the time, Christ is portrayed in this judgmental position, okay? Lording over us. And it was to instill a bit of fear. Now, we do need some fear of God, proper fear. When you understand the, the, the Jewish understanding of fear of the Lord, it means to know the Lord, to know who He is, and that we are not Him. And so that when you have a true knowledge and fear of the Lord, He's here, we're down here, we're going to have a natural fear of Him because of the awesomeness, the greatness of the Lord. Not a frightened fear, but a healthy fear. And so that's part of what we need from the justice side, that if we do wrong, he will judge us. And so we have a healthy fear of the Lord. But sometimes it went pretty extreme. And we see here some more depictions. Christ the judge with his angels judging, literally with the weights of justice. Right? And then what is this? Where is this from? Sistine Chapel. Sistine Chapel, right? The Last Judgments. Literally put in front of the cardinals to remind them this is where, right at the base of it, they put the bowl for the voting. That your votes will be held against you. Like you, you vote as if your life was at stake. It is. Remember this. You will be judged for this. And so even the cardinals of our church are reminded by this uh, upon the voting for the Pope. Now we kind of went from this kind of portrayal in general to kind of more this. I mean, I think that's kind of fair. I mean, that's the way Christ is portrayed today. Uh, much more compassionate, loving, forgiving. And that's fine, but it's not good when you go just to that, and you drop the judgment part, right? So we have to have an understanding, and, and you'll see this in the media, and you'll see, it. would Jesus do that? He's a compassionate and loving God, and this and that, and, da, da, da. and they'll use scripture, and they'll take pieces of scripture that back their ideology, instead of saying, but also he said this, like, literally today's gospel for the daily mass was about judgment. I could not believe it. Okay? I kid you not. And it's the passage that, uh, um, with Sidon, that if Sidon did not repent, it would be better for the city of Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment if they didn't repent. 
Literally, that's today's gospel. I'm like, okay, good timing. But this is what we're talking about. Okay, that's from Christ's own lips. It'll be better for Sodom than this city if they don't repent. But instead, we've kind of just done it all this. We need a healthy balance of understanding, compassion, and mercy. Because again, justice by its very name and nature is given some, giving someone what is due to them. And what is due to them is not always good for them or, or what they might like. If a criminal does a crime, it is due for them to go to jail. They might not like it, but that is what is owed to them. They broke the law and they are owed in a negative sense to go to jail. Restitution, right? They have broken the law. Same thing with us. When we break the law of God, when we sin and we do not repent, we are literally owed hell because we chose not to repent. We chose not to seek mercy. We chose to cling on to that sin instead and wager against God. I really have to say, as I've gone through some of the readings, how many times that idea of waging against or betting against God really comes up in our, when our understanding of sin and not repenting. But it doesn't help that when we just say, God is love, he forgives all. Well, why would we then seek his mercy? If we grow up in this mentality that God is love and, and everything is forgiven, and we don't put the second part in, which is, if we repent and seek his mercy. You know, like one of the biggest shortcomings, in my opinion again, of my seminary that I went to, was they would really emphasize, we need to be as priests and we need to go where the people are, where they're at in things. Okay, that's good. Step two is, and bring them where they need to be. Because if they're not in the right place, it is not good for me, a priest, to then condone and expound upon it. So if a parish is teaching the wrong thing, or living a wrong way, or doing a wrong liturgy, I don't just go along to get along. It is my responsibility to be there with them, and then bring them where they need to be. That's what we're talking about. That's what we're talking about. So mercy and compassion is something that we are owed and owe each other and ourselves, but have to seek it and be worthy of it, especially with the mercy, okay? As I said, I as a priest, when I hear someone's confession, I cannot, I don't have the ability to read souls, read hearts. If they say the words and they, see, they seem compassionate and repentant, I do the words of absolution. Only God himself knows what's really on their hearts and if they're going through the motion or not. Simply because I say the words doesn't mean you're absolved if you're not truly seeking it and receiving it. That is completely on you. So as I said, an important thing is that when we die, when our soul separates from the body, time and space no longer exist. No longer exist. And then if we understand that, I think this next statement really hits home. The time for repentance will be over, as will the time of mercy. When our time here on earth ends, that's it. Because we have already judged ourselves, basically. If we have not repented, we have not seen God's mercy, he's not going to go, oh, I like you. <laughs> it's okay. No. This is not to inspire fear, because a true Christian does not obey God's laws out of servile fear. He does it out of loving obedience. Where do we hear this? Christ on the cross. Loving obedience. And what put in there? Our disobedience at the beginning. One who lived according to the gospel here below has nothing to fear on the day of judgment. You have nothing to fear. 
if you live a life according to Christ and the Gospels, worthy of salvation, when your time comes, there's no fear. Life is changed, not ended. But when that moment comes, no more second chances. No more seeking mercy. So we have, for us, the particular judgment and the final judgment. Now we all hear about the final judgment. That's what's in the popular culture, right? When, when the, the big ending comes. But really, it's a both and, right? We love that term, both and. And so for Catholics, there's actually two times judgment for each of us, all right? The particular judgments versus the final or the last judgments. So what does that mean? So particular means the one, us individually, at the very moment that we die, and then the final judgments after the second coming. But well, there's a distinction with those two. So death puts an end to the human life as the time open to either accepting or rejecting the divine grace manifest in Christ. Accepting or rejecting, how do we do that? Not only through faith, but our actions. We accept it and then live it out, or we don't live it out. The New Testament speaks of judgment primarily in the aspect of a final encounter with Christ in his second coming, but also repeatedly affirms that each will be rewarded immediately after death in accordance with his works and faith. Again, major difference between us and Protestants. We believe in faith and works. They believe in faith alone. Faith alone saves you. We say no. Faith without works is dead. What book does that come from? James. Find the Protestant Bible. It's not in there. They got rid of the book of James. When something doesn't meet their criteria, go. The book. Same thing as we're going to talk about tomorrow. Purgatory for us is based in the book primarily of Maccabees. Maccabees gone in a Protestant Bible. So when it doesn't fit their theology, they get rid of Holy Scripture. The parable of the poor man, Lazarus, and the words of Christ on the cross of the, good, the, the, cross of the good thief, as well as other New Testament texts, speak of a final destiny of the soul, a destiny which can be different for some and for others. Okay? And there's only two destinations, heaven or hell. Purgatory is like the gateway, the antechamber, we're going to talk about tomorrow. Each man receives his eternal retribution in his mortal soul at the very moment of his death. The very moment. If anything, we are repetitive, just to knock it in our heads. At the moment of our death, we are judged by Christ. In a particular judgment that refers to his life to Christ, either entrance into the blessedness of the heaven through a purification or immediately, or immediate and everlasting damnation. Immediate and everlasting damnation. So, what did I say yesterday? Be prepared. Be prepared. And we, and he knows that we have a tendency to fail. We have that propensity. And so he gives us the church and the sacraments. It's not like he just left us on our own. He literally gave us the pathway through the church and the sacraments. And he says, I know you guys can't make it on your own. I'm giving you the church. I'm giving you the sacraments. Again, you get to either accept them or reject them. Accept them or reject them. And so every person upon their death is immediately judged. And... So, we know the infamous indulgences, right? There was this time off of purgatory, you know, days and years and months and all that. Again, it doesn't work that way. There is no time. There is no time. So when, we, when they used to sell indulgences, you know, and get a thousand days off of purgatory, no such thing. We cannot per earthly human time onto the divine. And so, not the best way to portray it. Um, so, but indulgences, 
are correct if properly done with intention and reconciliation. So each person is judged, boom, on themselves. So if they're judged at that point, who knows how they've been judged? God and them, okay? So then that's the particular judgment. God and them. And that's going to be a, a major thing with the final judgments. You're going to see. But this is really interesting. Furthermore, the full implications of the good or evil that we do in our lifetime will not be fully realized at the time of our particular judgments. These will have ripple effects on our children, our children's children, etc., and those around us, and those around them. Do our sins live on? Generation, did we teach wrong? Did we hand on evil things? Did we teach people to do evil things, and then therefore have their souls put at stake? Were we bad examples? Did we live an unchrist-like life and then hand that on to those around us? So the ripple effect is not only on our souls, but potentially on those around us for a very long time. Down through the years between our particular judgment and the end of time, this will be fully revealed in the final judgment. This will be fully revealed in the final judgment. And finally, since we, are sin we sin and perform virtuous acts as body and soul, composite, we talked about that yesterday, as part of the five unique aspects of human beings, we are body and soul, and it is the actions of our body that are judged against the soul. It's the actions of our bodies and words, actions and thoughts that are judged against the soul. It is fitting that we be judged as a body and soul composite as well, this too does not occur at our particular judgment, but at the final judgment. So at the particular judgment is only your soul. Your body is here, in some way, shape, or form. At the final judgment, it's reunited, in some way, shape, or form, that we do not fully understand. Okay? Final judgment, or last judgment. The resurrection of the dead, right? So we say that in the creed, that the resurrection of the dead. The resurrection of the dead will occur prior to Christ's second coming. Okay? And the dead, whether good or bad, will be reunited with their bodies. What does that look like? In what form? We have no idea. Okay? But they will be reunited. And those that are alive at the moment of Christ's second coming will be judged right then and there because they will be alive and their bodies and souls will be together. What happens at the second judgment, the final judgment, is a reaffirmation and public exposure of your particular judgment. All know now whether you are heaven or hell. All know now of Christ's judgment upon you, and you know of theirs. So it's not a second judgment, it's a ex it's an exposure of our particular judgments, that everyone knows what God's judgment was upon the individual. That is the final judgment. And that is upon the body and the soul. What does that look like? We don't know. We don't physically know what that looks like. We'll proceed with the last judgment, and it'll be the hour when all are in tunes to hear the Son of God, the Son, Son of Man's voice will come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgments. Then Christ will come in his glory with all the angels with him. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate them from one to another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep at his right hand, but the goats at his left, and they will go away in the eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. And everyone will know 
everyone's position. Everyone will know everyone's position. In the presence of Christ, who is truth itself, the truth of each man's relationship with God will be laid bare. Laid bare and open, exposed to everybody. Did you live in the manner that Christ called you to? Yes or no, everyone will know. The last judgment will reveal even to the furthest consequences the good each person has done or failed to do during his earthly life. That is what the church teaches as the final judgment. That it's laid bare what we individually did to accept or reject God. All that is wicked do is recorded and they do not know. When our God comes, he does not keep silence. He will turn towards those he le at the, his left hand. I place my poor little ones on earth for you. As their head was seated in heaven at the right hand of the Father, but on earth my members were suffering. My members were on earth were in need. If you gave anything to my members, what you gave would reach their head, would reach me, Christ, their creator, their savior. Would that you had known that my little ones were in need when I placed them on earth for you and appointed them your stewards, to bring your good works to my treasury, but you have placed nothing in their hands. Therefore, you have found nothing in my presence. That's what we're talking about. That's what we're talking about. I placed these little ones in front of you in whatever shape form it came in, and if you did not do what I expected you to do, what I called you to do, you will have nothing in my presence. My friends, this is our faith. And this is what we believe. This is what we teach. We don't get to accept or reject pieces of it. This is what we believe. This is what we've been given through Christ. Whether it sounds harsh or loving, we have a compassionate, merciful, but just God. He has expectations for us, not only for ourselves, but even more importantly, how do we treat others, particularly the least among us? Over and over and over that is in scripture. But if you have placed nothing in their hands, therefore you have nothing in my presence. Period. Period. The last judgment will come when Christ returns in glory. Only the Father knows when this will happen, the day and the hour. Only He determines the moment of its coming. Then through His Son, Jesus Christ, He will pronounce the final word on all history. On all history. We shall know the ultimate meaning of the whole work of creation and of the entire economy of salvation and understand the marvelous ways by which his providence led everything towards his final end. And what's his final end? God himself. That is the intended final end for each and every one of us. We either accept that or reject that in our words, our thoughts, our actions, and omissions. The last judgment will reveal that God's justice triumphs over all the injustices created by his creatures, and that God's love is stronger than death. That no matter what we do to hurt people, his love is greater than that. And he knows everything we've done to someone, individually, culturally, socially. He knows that, and he is greater than that, but he will keep justice for those who hurt others in whatever way it was. And that God's love is stronger than death. That by his death and resurrection and then ascension, he conquered death for our good, right? He gave an exchange of his life for ours. But then there was expectations that go with it. 
It's not a free ride. The message of the last judgment calls men to conversion while God is still giving them the acceptable time. Your time on here is the acceptable time. The day of salvation. It inspires a holy fear of God and commits them to the justice of the kingdom of God. It proclaims the blessed hope of the Lord's return and when he comes to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at in all who have believed. Remember, anyone who goes to heaven is a saint. Anyone who goes to heaven is a saint. Whether we recognize them or not, that's the whole very definition. One who is before God. One who is before God. Some we know and recognize, but I would hedge to say the overwhelming majority we do not know of. And so all who go to heaven, all who are before God, are saints. And so, what can we do about this all? What can we do if we find ourselves and believing that we may not be prepared at this very moment? God gave us something. Christ gave us confession, reconciliation, a very humbling thing. Do not be afraid of confession. Do not be afraid of it. Again, even if you have the worst priest that makes a comment, who does anything, who embarrasses you, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. If you are sincere about seeking God's mercy, you are absolved and forgiven. The individual priest, whatever kind of person he might be, doesn't matter. But if you partake in God's mercy and use the sacrament of reconciliation, because you have to remember, you have to have for mortal sin, you know it's grave matter, you are truly repentant of what you've done and will strive to amend your ways. Strive to amend your ways. And if you truly believe that in your heart and your soul, and God knows this, you are forgiven of what you've done and in a state of grace. That is what he wants of us. And so there is no excuse. Well, you had this grave sin. You knew about it. Well, I was too embarrassed. I was afraid to go to confession. I was afraid of the priest, what he was going to say, or what people might think. I mean, quite honestly, God's going to go, I don't care. I gave you this as the method to reconcile with me, and you rejected it. You chose, on a human level, that embarrassment or fear was more important than the salvation of your soul. And so if you die with it on your soul, human fear, human embarrassment will not be an excuse. And believe you me, one of the most, I, I cringe when I heard this in the confession. Father, I'm a good person. I just wanted to come to confession for the graces. Well, I see humility as one of your top things right there. That's a good thing. If you need to go to confession, go to confession. Sadly, this has been one of the um, biggest downfalls in the church, and part of it, in my opinion, is part of the church's fault. Because we've changed this idea of going from the extreme judgmental God to the all loving, merciful God. Well, if he's all loving and all merciful, I didn't do anything wrong. And so, we, you know, and then what happens is this vicious cycle starts. No one comes to confession, so we don't offer it as much. And then people go, why don't you offer a confession? Well, no one's coming. And so it becomes, a, you've been at Mass, and I said it, make us sit there. Make us go in line. Make us sit in the box. If not, why would I sit there for three hours? I can only offer it. I cannot force you to go. But this is something we need because this is what he's offered us as the way to salvation when we needed to seek his mercy. It may be painful. It may be embarrassing. It will save your life. So do it. This is the gift he's offered us. So, judgment. Immediate, 
And final, no second chances. Where time is here on earth, we have that ability to repent, to seek his mercy. Do we make mistakes? Sure. But this is why confession is repeatable. It's not a one and done. So if you have anything on your heart, on your soul, please go to confession. Reconcile with God, but truly mean it, because he knows. Thanks, everybody.